up. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a very good program here uh, with some tips and tricks uh, to writing, but also some uh, larger ideas about what a personal statement is and uh, why you write one and who it's for. So, so thinking about the audience and what you're writing for. Anyway, uh, my name is Tom Santa Maria. I am the Humanities and Social Science Graduate School Peer Fellow. I had to read that off the slide to know what I am. And a uh, sixth year in the Renaissance Studies and History Department. And uh, actually, I will let uh, maybe in order as they appear here, uh, the, my uh, colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly. I'm a fourth year um, in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering. And so I am Tom's counterpart advising on those of you interested in pursuing an MS or a PhD in STEM related fields. Um, so Paula, I guess you're up next. Thanks, Holly. I'm Paula Rollins. I'm the Assistant Director of the Yale College Writing Center. We are physically located in the Purdue Center and now open uh, and for in-person visits. Uh, yeah, seven days a week, 3 to 5 p.m. Um, but more plugs on that later. Um, for now, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to give you some tips and suggestions as you work on personal statements. I will wrap us up here. I'm Meredith Mira, and I'm a senior associate director in the Office of Career Strategy. And I, um, for the last couple of years, have been overseeing this graduate school uh, 101 series of which the personal statement writing workshop is a part. And um, I've had the privilege of working um, with Tom and Holly over the past year and some other really great um, grad peers over the course of the last five years. And we've always had a really wonderful relationship with the Writing Center and have come to recognize that this is such an integral part, of course, to the graduate school application process. So we've continued to keep this pulled out as a specific part of this process. And so thank you, Paula, for joining us here. I'm going to be jumping off of this call um, call workshop um, in a few moments, but just by way of background, um, I have my own doctoral degree in education, so in uh, areas of social science. So if um, you know there's ever a time in which uh, Tom and Holly, um, I'm sure they will be a wonderful support to begin with, but feel like they want a second set of thoughts around social sciences, I can certainly always be that person. Um, I do see that there's a Q&A in the Q&A chat, which is um, great to see. That's exactly what you should do. And I think, Paula, that might be a question. For, oh, you're typing the answer. She's already answering. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to do this too. And I said, so uh, I think in some ways we can say that you've already gained something from this and that there are some, uh, you know, some people to turn to, to um, help you as a uh, you know, before we've even got it, gotten started here. And then obviously look how seamless this team is answering questions uh, as they as they come along. So you're in the right place. Uh, Holly, I'm thinking you're sharing the screen. Okay, yes, you are, thanks. Okay, I will, so. I will say to the person who was asking the question um, in terms of recent grads using the writing center, um, it sounds like not in the case of the, uh, the writing center, but you are able to work with the Office of Career Strategy as an alum and you could continue to meet with Tom or Holly um, and they can take a look at writing, uh, at writing statements, at personal statements. So just a, a note. Um, all right, I will turn it back over. Thanks, Meredith. So, um, okay, writing the personal statement. What's it about? Who's it for? Uh, well, he, and, and, and why do you do this really is sort of some questions we're gonna take on here. Um, okay, here's, what it's not, and then we'll give you your corollary of what it is. So it's not um, a evidence of how well you can use your thesaurus or inspire emotions. What it is, is talking about your intellectual and uh, professional journey, what uh, you have done sort of intellectually or professionally, and what you uh, hope to do uh, as you move forward. Um, it's not a past focus here, meaning, you know, I think we have a tendency, especially when we're doing our undergraduate statement to, uh, you know, explain why we want to go to college or whatever. And you say, well, ever since I was uh, such and such, I've been, uh, interested in this or, you know, uh, this or that, um, instead you could think about, uh, 
your goals if you're applying for master's degrees and especially phds they're going to be research and professional goals uh you know maybe in the academy or thereafter uh professionally but also research and then ultimately i think uh you aren't just taking a, a cv or a resume um and putting it in narrative form uh instead it is uh, i'd like your persuasive essay um that that tells about you uh from the story of the life of your mind really that's what an intellectual autobiography is okay so you're trying to uh convince people ultimately that you are a colleague of theirs, that you belong at their uh, institution, that you're prepared to take on uh, the work of, uh, you know, a graduate degree, master's or, or PhD, or also uh, pro a professional position, and uh, that uh, this position or place in graduate school is going to help you go where you need to go in the future, where you want to go in the future. So obviously people are coming from uh, different backgrounds uh, as they take on the personal statement. Um, but all, what you wanna do is, as we said, show your experience. Um, if you're coming out of undergraduate, you'll definitely be emphasizing your co coursework and things you've gained from coursework, skills in research, um, but maybe you know in lab or things like that. What questions have you been grappling with uh, as, as an undergraduate or, or even graduate student. Um, and, you know, maybe you've, if in my field, for example, I'm a historian, you've perhaps picked up uh, some paleographical skills or language skills, lab skills. Uh, if you're a science and STEM person, uh, you might have some job experience where you've managed uh, a people or something like that. We always like to see that in, in job uh, writing for sure. Um, so, Perhaps in one, one way that the personal statement might be a little bit like an undergraduate essay is that you do want to have some sense of what your motivation is. Why are you going uh, to, why do you want to attend graduate school? Uh, what is it you want to learn? And um, what do you think you're going to gain from the experience? And then this dovetails nicely into the third point here about PhD programs. What is this... Uh, what's the questions that you want to grapple with? What do you, uh, you know, what do you want to research now? I think we get this uh, question a lot uh, in terms of writing the personal statement, how for PhD applications, how uh, specific or in depth should a person approach this question of, of their research topic? And, uh, you know, above all, what you want to do, I think is show that there is some question that you have a, an interest in answering. You don't need to have a full prospectus. You know, you'll do a prospectus for, for the doctoral students among you. You'll do a prospectus while you're in the program. You don't need to do it beforehand. There's plenty of time for that. You have coursework first and maybe exams too before uh, you get there. And then uh, this um, another thing you want to communicate is why a particular program or school? Um, and we'll talk more about this later, but I think, you know, this is a, a place where you can show you've done some research in your, in your personal statement on the institution you're applying to, uh, that you are able to speak uh, about the faculty there, you know, for definitely for PhD students, uh, you'll, you'll want to mention by name, potential advisors, um, and, uh, you know, maybe a potential advisor, but also other faculty that can help you and support you in your program. And then you will also want to mention some of the resources the school might have, um, whether you're a master's student or a PhD student as well. You know, are there certain libraries or certain funding opportunities, maybe a, uh, a broad immersion program of some kind, uh, labs that uh, have particular, uh, I don't know, um, machinery that can help you uh, study certain things. Um, and then finally, it says you're optional for PhD, but I think helpful and de definitely critical for MA and MF, uh, master, you know, master's degrees. What do you want to do? How is the institution you're applying to uh, and the program you're applying to, the people and the resources, they're going to help you get to where you want to be? Um, so again, 
we're emphasizing this is a narrative. It's your time to tell a story about you, what you've done, what you want to do, and how you're ready uh, to take on the challenges uh, and the exciting challenges of uh, graduate study. Okay, so some general thoughts about structure and how to tackle this uh, personal statement. Um, like most uh, writing, you wanna have some interesting uh, hook to get people uh, thinking about, I can also see that I'm like streaming with light here. I'm gonna see if I can shut the shutters for one second real quick. Otherwise, that could be kind of hard. All right, my apologies. So uh, you're gonna want to uh, think about um, a good way to you know, introduce the readers who, by the way, are gonna be reading a lot of these uh, statements to uh, who you are and what you're gonna basically tell them in um, your personal statement, okay? So then you will uh, talk a little bit about, as we have been saying, your intellectual autobiography, what you've done, what, what courses you've taken, what, um, what questions you've asked, what maybe papers you've written. Uh, some of you might even have experience giving papers, uh, conferences, you could certainly talk about that. Um, and then you'll also want to talk about why uh, grad school, you know, maybe uh, that you've been inspired by, by a professor, you, you've done some research that, um, you know, you think is going to change the world if you can continue exploring it. Some of us feel that way. I felt that way once. Uh, now, uh, well, you know, while I find it interesting, I'm not so sure I'm going to change the world. But there you have it. Um, so uh, another another thing that you uh, might be thinking about is, uh, for example, this is I was in this category. Um, how are you going to go from one field to another? You might be, if you're like me, I was a classics major going into history. So uh, what you want to do ultimately, and I think that this shows a uh, this is a case in point with pivoting fields is show how the experiences you have, how you're gonna build on them, okay, in graduate school uh, and, and show how you can transfer, even if it doesn't, uh, even if it's not exactly what you've been doing, how you're gonna transfer your skills, experiences, uh, learning um, to future studies. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to pick up on this slide here. And so we're now transitioning out of perhaps what you've done in the past to what you are doing currently and or what you want to do in the future. So we, again, all of these recommendations in terms of length of paragraphs or its number of sentences are really dependent on you and your statements. So there's no hard and fast rule here, but we wanted to give some sort of a structure. Um, so you really, as Tom motivated, laid out your past experiences and your interests, what has really gotten you into this field and how have you pursued that interest? And then you then connect it to a strong transition um, where you draw a clear line between what you've done in the past and what you want to do in the future. And so for PhD programs, what this looks like is discussing specific research experiences from what you've done in the past and why they impacted you and how that might um, connect to the research you want to do in the future. And then for MA or MS programs, this can perhaps include a discussion of job experiences, internship experiences, um, coursework, and then what they mean to you. And so as I've been laying out this whole time, very clearly delineate why the experiences from your past have motivated you to want to pursue graduate school. Um, and so what that can look like for an MA or MS, what coursework or skills are you looking to gain? I've had a number of conversations with um, like weirdly, I guess, mechanical engineers who are looking to transition into aerospace engineering. Um, so they are a mechanical engineer undergrad looking to transition into aerospace so they can clearly lay out, these are the experiences that I had as a mechanical engineer. Um, these are the courses or skills that I want to gain in a master's degree program um, in the future. And then for a PhD program, what research topic or topics excite you? Um, and as Tom said, this doesn't have to be so totally fleshed out that you already know what your thesis is truly going to be. But you do want to know generally under what umbrella you want to sit. Um, and then as we were kind of mentioning in the first couple of slides, what do you want to do with your graduate degree? 
I think this is really, really crucial for a master's degree because it's a short professional degree of one to two years. So thinking about how you're going to use graduate school as a stepping stone from where you are to where you want to be um, should be really clearly laid out. For a PhD program, you can have these questions already in your mind of, well, I really want to be an academic. I want to be a professor doing research. And so very clearly going into a PhD program will again be that stepping stone from A to B. But I will say for a PhD program, which is often a lot longer than a master's program, um, you don't necessarily have to come in with this knowledge of, okay, I definitely want to be an academic or I definitely don't. Um, so that's why we kind of laid it out as optional in the first couple of slides. And so the next bulk of it, I think Tom would perhaps agree, um, is that this is the really meaty, important part of the statement in that it is just one paragraph demonstrating the mutual compatibility between you and the program. So why is this program a good fit for you and why are you a good fit for this program? Um, and of course, this perhaps goes without saying, but this should be unique to each school or program that you are applying to. So if I were to read your statement and swap out Harvard for Yale or Yale for Harvard, the statement should no longer make sense because you really want to be specific about what is it about this particular program um, that is driving you to want to apply. So for a PhD program, this can mean meaningfully name dropping some faculty members to show that you've done your research of does this institution have the faculty, have the support for the research that you want to do? Are there two or three people that can support you in your like proposed research journey? Um, and if so, what are their names? Um, you can also connect your skill sets, whether that's research or otherwise, to the program itself. And so if you've done research in, I'll use myself an example, you've done research in the field of drinking water treatment and you want to now transition to um, wastewater treatment, you can really clearly, again, draw this line between what you've done to what you want to do in the future. And so again, as Tom was mentioning, um, discuss really specific resources or coursework or collaborations or certificates that you're excited about if you're applying to a master's degree and what really excites you about this master's of education is that you will be getting into schools in Boston and New Haven, whatever, um, be specific about that. Say that this is why you are applying to the Harvard School of Education to get into classrooms or something along those lines. So as specific as you can be, the better. And so by the end of reading this paragraph, um, the audience to whom you're communicating, the admissions committee, the faculty should have a really clear sense of how would this program benefit you? And then how would they, and then how would you benefit this program? What new interesting questions or interests or um, experiences will you be bringing to this program that will help enrich it and enliven the community? And so in general, we just laid out a ton of different considerations of questions to answer, but the statement is actually kind of short. In fact, it's um, usually between one to two pages, single spaced, which is about a thousand words. So you basically have to connect your past experiences to your future, one, your future goals all in the course of a thousand words, which is not an easy feat, I guess to say. So we'll talk about this at the end, but we definitely recommend that you go through as many drafts as you need. Don't worry about the page or word limit, just get your ideas down on paper first um, and then work towards massaging some of the language and um, the tone of the, the document itself. And so with that, we are gonna transition really quickly um, to just some general advice about tone because this statement is perhaps unlike anything that you have ever written <laughs> and also perhaps um, you will never write anything like this ever again. And so I think one thing that I wanna emphasize in terms of tone is that this is called a personal statement for a reason. It should not be devoid of your personal voice and um, it shouldn't just be a regurgitation of your resume. I did this, then I did this. Um, really infuse it with your curiosities, your passions, the projects that you've been working on um, because the rest of your application package will either be just numbers, in the GRE score or GPA or other people telling your story. 
in the recommendation letter. So this is really your opportunity and your only opportunity to showcase your own perspective and voice. When you're writing this, we really want you to be as specific and detailed and concrete as you can in your examples. And so I was a conscientious advocate for my students in the classroom. Okay, that's great. What does that mean? <laughs> so instead, by developing individ individualized learning plans for my students and advocating for their needs to the school administration, I extended my teaching role beyond classroom instruction. So you demonstrated how you were a conscientious, conscientious advocate by naming the ways in which you were doing that. Be original, interesting, and not cliche in your language. Um, this I think is something to that we sometimes struggle with because again, we don't wanna place ourselves at the center of the narrative, but by being yourself and having that personal tone you are in fact a unique person. So your personal statement will also come across as such. So instead I bring to my graduate school research a passion for mathematics. Well, everyone can say that if they're applying to a PhD program in mathematics. How are you passionate? What does that actually mean? Um, something like I, the complexity of mathematics coupled with its endless puzzles yet to be unraveled, make me excited to pursue a graduate level research, the Yale Department of Mathematics. So again, not just are you passionate, what are you passionate about in mathematics? It's the puzzle, it's the unraveling. So something specific like that. Be active and purposeful in your narrative. This is something that I see a lot in um, people who are perhaps struggling with what we all struggle with of imposter syndrome of feeling like, well, I didn't actually do it. It was a team effort. Um, I see this frequently in lab-based research because lab research is really collaborative and oftentimes you are only contributing one part to the project as a whole, but you are still an integral part of that project. And so um, as an example, I was lucky enough to do research with Professor Smith in my junior year. Well, you weren't lucky. You didn't just stumble into it. It didn't fall out of the sky. You made that conscientious choice. So inspired by the exciting questions I uncovered in my ecology class, I pursued a research opportunity with Professor Smith to more fully indulge my curiosities. Um, in the same way, you are putting yourself at the center of the narrative of why did you make the decisions that you did? It wasn't just luck and it wasn't just accidental. You chose opportunities, chose research experiences, chose classes, chose majors, because something about it was exciting or interesting to you. And so be active in showing that off in your personal statement. Um, so as a, as a whole, <laughs> you are kind of being your best salesperson in selling your passions and your skills to this program. Um, so of course we all know the like cheesy car salesman that's perhaps like overconfident um, and perhaps puts themselves too much at the forefront. Um, so that kind of varies in the side of show offiness versus confidence. And that's a difficult line to toe sometimes. Um, I definitely more frequently see people who are less likely to claim credit for their own work, but I have seen a couple of instances um, I had a student use the language, I refuse to participate because I didn't feel my ideas were um, being heard by the professor. And so that comes to uh, perhaps too far on the other end of the spectrum of you want to be confident in what you're doing, but you don't also, you also want to um, not show off or put yourself a lot higher because you are going to graduate school to learn more. And so for PhD statements, um, you really want to use the tone of the statement to present yourself as a future colleague. So when you're doing research in the lab or you're doing archival research, you are going to be a colleague of these professors. You're going to be generating new knowledge. You're going to be engaging in a new territory that is unexplored. And so you want to make sure that the statement conveys that you are ready and mature and capable of having these complex thoughts, communicating these thoughts, because um, unlike undergrad, where you're perhaps sitting in a 500 person classroom having someone talk at you, it's going to be the other way of you are going to be the expert. You are going to be the one talking to that room of 500 people. And so I think that's just a shift in a perspective that is perhaps unique to writing this PhD statement. And so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Paula, who's going to run us through um, some general advice for style. 
Thanks, Holly. And a lot of what I plan to say here at the beginning about style, Holly really just hit on with her points about tone and that um, the content of your application, the content of your essay is really what's going to get you into the program and like demonstrate your readiness to do the work of graduate school, but your tone and your style will really make a difference in how, what kind of impression you make on the committee. And so thinking about making sure you draft early and take time to get the content down right so that you can then go through several drafts where you're just refining for tone, style, um, to make sure that you're coming across with the ethos that you want, that you're a smart, thoughtful uh, person who would make an excellent colleague <laughs> that someone wants to work with as a graduate student um, at their university. So I am gonna go over just a few tips here and then I'll share a handout with you that goes into more detail about each of these items that you can refer to later. And we'll do some practice with these tips as well. The first is to make sure you use verbs to express the action in a sentence. And that might sound obvious, but this goes back to one of, I think, the first points Tom mentioned, which is the personal statement isn't about proving you can use the thesaurus or really in being in, impressing people with your language use. Think about the committees that are reading these statements. They're looking at a lot and they, have, they need to do so in a relatively short period of time. So you want your writing to be as concise and clear as possible. So overly long sentences, really complex sentences, this isn't the place for them. You can, you can write plenty of those when you're working on your uh, journal articles and your dissertation. For now, you want to get to the point and make it Except easy maybe for Maybe please don't do that either yeah. because, <laughs> you know, spare me, okay? Yeah, Tom, thank you. <laughs> That's good to hear from a history person too. Um, <laughs> um, so you, you wanna uh, get to the point and make your statement memorable by being concise and clear. So looking at each sentence, who is doing the action here and what is the action? Let's make sure that that action is expressed as a verb. So, um, words that end and actually realize that this isn't the best example that I've given you here, but uh, we'll see some in a second, but words that end in suffixes like M-E-N-T, um, excitement, or patience that ends in E-N-C-E, or T-I-O-N, they turn verb into nouns, and you want to look through your statement for those words and see if there isn't a way to avoid those and make them into clearer uh, noun verb statements. So uh, this is the example I have here is, is really more of an example of just getting down to the point in the most important, uh, important verb. Instead of using anticipation, uh, which is a nominalization, we're gonna say, I anticipated the worst. And it makes it very clear subject verb at the beginning. Look for um, forms of to be and replace those with mo more active verbs. So you might've heard of this idea as getting rid of passive voice. We know that staying in the active voice makes our prose feel more lively and more memorable. So you wanna look for every was, is, become, those, you're not gonna be able to get rid of all of them, but you can get rid of a lot of them and substitute more memorable and active um, words. So I was overcome with grief versus I sobbed. And I realized that my first two examples here are really sad. So I hope that your personal, <laughs> if your personal statement includes a, you know, a sad story that, it, that you have a, a, a nice story of resilience and a good outcome. Um, the other thing I was, I was going to say something else about those, and then I got off track. I apologize. Um, oh, these things also make, notice as you're making some of your sentences more concise, you're getting rid of words, which means you're going to have more space 
to put more of the great things that you've done and include more evidence. So it's not just about making it clear and memorable and exciting to read, but also about getting as much content in there as we can. Um, you wanna limit adjectives and adverbs. So I think it was Stephen King that said that the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Uh, anything that ends in an L-Y, you wanna be suspicious of and see if you could get rid of it. So instead of I slowly walked, let's just choose a stronger verb like strolled. Sometimes, sometimes you'll find an adjective and an adverb that really brings something to the sentence. But you wanna look in carefully and say, is this really necessary? If I read this a lot, if I read this without that adverb, is it just a strong, is there a verb that I could put in the place of this adverb, uh, adverb and phrase? Be concise, obviously all of these points are going to that uh, idea, but some more ideas and ways to be concise are looking for words that have very little meaning. Some of the most popular that we'll see are words like very, actually, really, completely. Uh, again, you'll hear that a lot of those are adverbs. And then you wanna get rid of those. If it doesn't mean anything, if it doesn't bring any meaning to the paper, get rid of it. Uh, other phrases uh, that just become wordy, first and foremost, each and every, um, those are things that we can look for and get rid of. Deleting words that are implied by others. So to say something's a terrible tragedy is redundant. A tragedy is by definition something terrible that has happened. A period of time. If it's, <laughs> if it's uh, some time or a period, then it's obviously consisting of time. Um, Replace phrases with words. Again, phrases like in the event that, increase the number of, could become more. Uh, change negatives to affirmative. So as saying that something is not often, you can say it rarely happens. Replace words with punctuation. So things like, for example, often are unnecessary. If, you're, if you make a statement, you're, you should follow up with evidence of that claim. And so a lot of times you can get rid of, for example, and it's, it doesn't take away anything from the, the flow of your statement. Therefore can often be replaced with a semicolon because that semicolon tells us these are two statements that are closely connected in some way. And then the final one that I know that you've all heard <laughs> lots of times um, is to proofread. And again, make time or editing as a, a real uh, phase of the writing process. If you can, um, get someone to help you and look over together with you your work. And that's where the Writing Center might come in or some other folks at the OCS or uh, friends, whoever uh, is in this process with you. I say that because working with writers in the writing center will often have them read aloud work. And when they read aloud their work, they'll correct what's on the page without even realizing that they've corrected what was on the page. Because in their mind, they know what they meant to say. And I'll be the one that says, oh, wait, you just said it this way, which is actually cor correct in what you're going for. So let's make that change. So if you can find someone to read along with you, um, definitely always read your work aloud to yourself so that you're slowly going over each word or phrase. A few tricks that can help you to get that sort of distance from the paper so that your, your brain isn't doing that fantastic thing it does where it just kind of corrects the mistakes for you because it knows what you meant you can defamiliarize the writing by reading it backwards. So start by reading your last sentence first and you're just looking at it at the sentence level. Does this sentence work? Is it accurate um, grammatically? Another way to defamiliarize that I find really helpful is if I've, obviously I've typed most things on my laptop, but if it's something important, 
Um, like this morning, I was writing a recommendation letter for someone. I proofread it on my laptop once, but then I also printed it out um, because to put something on a different format actually, again, tricks your brain. It thinks that this is something new that they ha it hasn't seen before. So it's gonna be pay, pay closer attention to that language and help you spot your errors. No matter if you at all possible can take time between um, drafting and proofreading. And again, with your personal statements, you're hopefully working over with them over a course of, of many weeks. So that should be uh, an easy one to do. I want to take time now to actually practice some of this. So first in the um, chat, I'm gonna drop a link to, um, and let me know if that doesn't work. Um, oh, no, it didn't. So let me try this one more time, apologies. That might've been my fault if I, I think I disabled the chats just for participants, but I might have disabled it for everyone. Oh, okay. Let's see. Could I see it, Paul? Paul, I just saw what you put in oh, the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did the link work for you, though? Uh, oh, no, it didn't. The link did not work for me. <laughs> Look, there's... I'm getting a not found error 404. Try it now. Yeah, when I put that in there, I was like, that's not what... A Google Doc usually looks like. Does that okay, work? This works. Now? Yep, okay, this great. <laughs> so this, um, what I just sent you gives you um, more detail about each of the um, items we just talked about, if you want to use that as a reference. And then I have a paragraph for us to look at together. And I'm going to send you another link that will allow you to actually work with the text on the screen. Connections being really slow today. <laughs> so looking over those tips we just talked about, and then looking at this paragraph, you can, again, if you can copy it and paste it into your own Google Doc or document, take, let's take three minutes. And I want you to see what changes would you make here? Um, what are your opportunities to be more concise um, using the tips that we just reviewed? So I'll be quiet. Um, if you have any questions or anything's unclear, you're having trouble with the links, let me know.
Okay, so even if you didn't make it through all of our points, maybe you've had enough time to find a couple of things here you could make less wordy and clearer. Um, oops. I did not mean to, oh, okay. <laughs> um, is, um, is there anyone who can share something they saw uh, that you would revise in order to make this more concise? You can put, if you have a answer to that, you can put it in the q and A. I I don't think they can like come off mute or put it in the chat. So you can just throw that in the Q&A. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, Holly. Wait, wait 30 seconds to see if anyone going to be brave. All right, so someone says there's a lot of passive voice that could be removed to make more direct, and that's absolutely correct. So remember, one of the, the hints or tips for spotting passive voice is to look for any version of is. And the first two sentences both start with I was, and that's a, a clear signal that you can make that sentence more active. So instead of I was eager to gain hands-on experience and training after completing high school, um, we could make it I gained hands-on experience and training after completing high school. Instead of, I was in awe as I watched, we could just change to, I watched. Um, the awe should be something that you're trying to convey through the details you're providing of what it is you're watching. Uh, so also in the Q&A, someone says, it would be more powerful to lead with the experience. I, starting with, I volunteered. Absolutely, great. Um, that's another place where, this writer has the opportunity to avoid the passive voice. Instead of, so I became a volunteer, just say, I volunteered. <laughs> That's a great way to, to get rid of two words and also be more direct and sound more active. Because as Holly and Tom have been suggesting this whole time, this is about you and how great you are and all the actions you've taken to get you to where you are today. Awesome. Well, great, great suggestions. Thanks for those of, uh, of you um, offering some answers in the, the q and I'll show you real quickly. Um, thanks, Holly. Uh, so this is an example. It, it shows you all the changes that we might make. Obviously, there's no one right answer. But again, they get rid of those passive voices. You can also see where um, they get rid of that example of a nominalization I was talking about was that brought the checkup to completion instead just you completed the checkup is a much clearer way to say that. Um, yeah. And again, instead of uh, there's a lot of at the end, a lot of kind of extra wordiness that's not needed. My biggest feeling, though, instead just I felt is clearer um, and, and more direct. Excellent. Okay. And I think the next slide shows us, yeah, this is what it would look like without the, the red ink. Uh, and it's a shorter paragraph, as you can see, but it's also a more compelling one. I will say, as a, a, a very experienced writing tutor, I still need other people to help point out where I've done these things because it's so hard to see your own work through other eyes. And so that is one reason why I really hope that you'll come visit us in the writing center. Um, Holly, tell me if I'm get, get cutting to the chase and putting in my book too soon. Um, but I do wanna put in the chat two links for you. One is to our Writing Center webpage, and there you can learn more about the Writing Center and our services. And then if you know that you would like to make an appointment, um, we, we currently take appointments online. 
and that link will be coming next. Um, so we take appointments in the evenings and then we are drop-in only in person in our Purdue Center location, which is at 301 York Street. You come in through security and then go up the stairs. Um, there's an elevator to the right if you need it. And then you'll be in the writing center. And from 3 to 5 p.m. every day, there are writing partners there ready to help you with whatever writing task you might want to look at with them, including personal statements. And they're also there Fridays, um, 10 a.m. to noon, just because we want to be careful and not have more than we can't have more than 20 people in the space at once. We do have a waiting list. Um, and if things are busy, we'll ask um, that you put your name on the waiting list and keep an eye on it um, and come back when you're high on the list. But please eat, reach out and email me with any questions, concerns whatsoever. We'd love to help you with your personal statement. And that goes for Tom and I as well. We also, you can make an appointment with us through the Yale career link. Um, we, we read personal statements and just generally advise on the grad school process. So wherever you are in it, um, feel free to make an appointment with either of us. I'll say, Paula, I am in the same boat as you as, as you were going through all of those tips. I am in the middle of writing something right now. And I was like, oh God, I do all of these things. Um, and I think particular, maybe not particular, but I've noticed that science writing tends to be really passive voice heavy. And so I oftentimes struggle to transition into active voice just because I so often am writing in the passive voice. So it's great to know that you guys exist as a resource to help get me out of my own head because I just, so anyway. Absolutely. And Holly, remember, and if you're applying to graduate programs at Yale, everyone else remember that we have the graduate writing lab for graduate students as well. <laughs> yeah, great to know. Um, so for those of you that are on the call, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you showing up. Hopefully these tips and tricks and just general outlines were helpful to you. Of course, as I said, if you have specific questions to your process, make an appointment with any of us. We are all here to help and chat. Um, but if you have any questions generally that you think would be helpful, feel free to put that in the Q&A. Otherwise, go enjoy your beautiful fall day <laughs> while the sun is shining. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at another OCS event or a writing center event soon. So have a good evening. Thanks everyone. <laughs>